For decades, marine captivity has been one of the most profitable industries in the tourism sector, bringing millions of people around the world to watch these animals jump, splash and play. But in recent years, a much darker side to the industry has come to light. Whilst many of the marine parks are thousands of miles away, Europe still has over 30 dolphin area and some are closer than you think. My name's Johnny Meir and I'm flying to the southeast of France, less than two hours from London Gatwick, to Marineland Antigues. I want to see for myself exactly what goes on in these parks. You know, I don't want this to be a propaganda piece. I want everyone to have their chance to have their say on the matter. And I think that's the only way that we can move on. I want to find out what life is like for these animals. It's a prison. It's, that's exactly what it is. It wouldn't be releasing, it would be kicking them out. What goes on behind the scenes. I personally drug whales at Marineland. Yeah, she's, she's trained for it. She's trained for artificial insemination. And where, in light of SeaWorld's decision to ban the breeding of orca, do the likes of Marineland see themselves now? We're talking with them about why, for a start, they would do this. Welcome to Antibes, a piece of paradise on the French Riviera, famous for its fancy super yachts, crystal clear Mediterranean waters and its gorgeous old town. And with around 1.3 million tourists visiting it per year, Antibes also lays claim to the biggest marine park in Europe and the only French sea park to have orcas. I have to say, first things first, I was really shocked that France even had dolphins and orcas in captivity in the first place. You know, I thought they were a, a country that was similar in, in the outlook of captivity for these sort of animals and marine animals as we are in the UK. I understand there are two sides to every story. So, you know, some people say that it's an educational experience, whereas others think it's, it's you know, demeaning for the animals and things like that. But I want to see both sides of the story. So I'll be hopefully meeting up with the guys from Marineland to find out their opinion. And also uh, the world famous marine biologist, Dr. Ingrid Fisser. But first I'm heading off to meet with the Born Free Foundation, who along with Ingrid have been analyzing marine parks across Europe to make sure they're complying with a piece of legislation called the EU Susta. Directive. This research that you're doing, what sort of things have you been seeing so far in Europe? Well, we've seen a lot of stereotypical behaviour almost in every facility. So that would include chewing on the concrete, logging, bobbing up and down, burping. Um, we've seen a lot of regurgitation of their food. And why is it that they do this, do you think? What's the prime reason? One that... word, boredom. And how can you tell that? There's just nothing stimulating for them to do other than the feeding session and the training. So there is some training to alleviate the boredom, but it's the same training they've been doing for 5, 10, 20 years. And there's nothing in the tank, just the concrete wall. What's the overall solution? Because they can't just be chucked out and into the wild, surely? There are, of course, obvious solutions to this. The quickest, easiest and most realistic is to end the breeding of cetaceans in captivity. You know, even if that was implemented, say, next year, the industry would have, I don't know, around 40 years to continue displaying the newest generation of animals that it has. And then in the meantime, we could look at seaside sanctuaries. So hearing from Born Free today was enlightening and it was great to hear their opinion, but I still want to hear from Marineland and we haven't heard from them yet. I've emailed them, I've phoned them over the past couple of weeks and I've had absolutely nothing back. So if I don't hear anything back after this email, then I guess... I'm gonna to have to go in there and see if we can speak to them, you know, face to face and see if we can get that interview there. Um, I'm gonna send this email, head to bed and hope that we get a response in the morning. Today, I want to see Marineland for myself and look at things purely through the eyes of a tourist. Marineland is home to nearly 40 different species, including sea lions, polar bears, orca and dolphins. And with that many different animals to see, you'd really expect there to be a few more visitors around. As a tourist, obviously it's difficult to say without the, the, the show starting here, but without any of the music, without any of the, uh, the charade, if you like, it does come down to one giant pool. Um, and I've been sitting here for about 10 minutes or so, and these guys, these dolphins, have just been going round and round and round. And maybe it's just a form of them getting exercise, um, but to me it seems a bit of a tease that the sea is just there, literally just a, a stone throw away, and they're going round and round and round in this pool. 
As much as I'm trying to stay neutral, I can't help but think the dolphins seem completely bored. But I don't want to be too quick to judge so early on in the day, so I've decided to head back later, which gives me some time to see Marineland's four orcas who are about to perform in the first show of the day. Wow. And here it is, the orca tank. To be honest, on first inspection, it, it looks big, it looks huge. I haven't seen any of the orcas yet, um, but the show's about to start and looking at, oh, there's one over there. I mean, they, they've got several pools here and uh, I've certainly never seen a tank this big personally. Um, but against the backdrop and stuff, you've got the Alps there. It all looks pretty lovely in the sun. But I guess you've got to look deeper. The thing is, on the big screen, you know, you feel like you're learning something because they've got so many facts that are happening up there and how we're preserving the planet and how we're helping the species. And it makes you feel like this is, this is so right and everything, there's a purpose here. It's for a good, good reason. And that's what I want to find out, is it? Does it help? I mean, it's clear that the trainers, they have an undeniable bond with these animals. They clearly love them, you can see that. But you've got to ask yourself then, if they love them that much, can this really be bad for the animals that they do adore? Or would they take a stand? You can't blame people for enjoying themselves here because it seems so right. It seems like it's for education. It seems like it's for a reason that's for good. You know, people are clapping, they're laughing, and they're learning. But are they? That's the question. After the theatrics of the show, though, once again, the atmosphere is completely different. The same animals that were jumping about and somersaulting through the air now seem lifeless and bored. But it's seeing how different the dolphins are during the show compared to this morning that I'm starting to gain a clear picture. Again, it's a performance. That's why it seems at the moment it's a performance. But there's all smiles, you can't help but smile. And again, I don't know if that's because of the music, if that's because everyone else is smiling. I can't tell you why it is. But something about a dolphin pushing someone by the feet, you don't have to be an expert to tell that that's not a natural thing to do. I can see why people come to the park to get an educational or perceived educational experience, but I can't help but feel that these animals may be depressed. They only seem to come alive during their shows, and it seems to me that behind the scenes, there's a lot more than meets the eye. So I've organised to have a chat with ex-Marineland supervisor John Hargrove. So I left SeaWorld of California as a senior trainer to basically run and take over the killer whale program in France because they wanted a sea world product. They wanted to swim with their killer whales. They had never had trainers in the water with those whales. They didn't know how to do it. And so myself and another sea world trainer from another park, we went over, we took over the program, uh, and we certainly had our fair share of aggressions. I, I personally had about 10 major water work aggressions and the other uh, SeaWorld trainer, she had about uh, 25 to 30. Talk to me, John, about the way that the animals are treated in marine land. I mean, I'll say this. Trainers love the whales. They do. We went into it with the purest of intentions. We were children. We didn't know any better. When I went into it, I started in 93, uh, resigned in 2012. I had no reason to believe that these whales lived anything less than a perfect existence. It wasn't until I was in my career and in my career for years before you started seeing things and realizing, certainly once we started separating calves from their mothers and you would see the way that mothers and the calves would react and the trauma, uh, all the drugs, the premature deaths. I mean, the, all those whales are doped up on so much medication, it's unbelievable. So are, are these animals in marine land, do you think that they would have to be drugged up? Absolutely. I personally, drug whales at Marineland. And wow. I certainly wasn't the only one. So what's the future then, as a result of this sort of public pressure, what's the future for the likes of Marineland? You know, I think they're kidding themselves if they think that they're gonna to continue to have orcas in captivity and people are going to accept that. Um, you know, the mounting public pressure on them is going to do exactly to them what happened to SeaWorld. Listen, if, if SeaWorld, the likes of SeaWorld, a multi-billion dollar corporation, could not handle the pressure and the magnitude of the pressure that was being put on them 
Um, Marineland and Antibes is certainly not going to be able to handle that because they are nothing compared to SeaWorld in the United States as far as size or money or resources. And if they want to try it, they want to go for it, and they want to try to play the game, good luck. We'll see who wins in the end. It's clear that the debate surrounding these animals in captivity is almost warlike. But today, I'm keen to get some facts on the matter. So I'll be spending time with Dr. Ingrid Visser as she carries out her research in the park. So I'm looking for things that show the issues. And one of the classic ones is what's termed stereotypies, and that's abnormal, repetitive behaviours that to us have no obvious outward function. You know, I've seen concrete chewing, I've seen them uh, head bobbing, I've seen them pattern swimming, I've seen them uh, doing all sorts of repetitive behaviours. And so that's the sort of thing that I'm documenting. But I'm also looking for self-mutilation, where they repeatedly hit themselves in one place or another, and um, they end up damaging themselves and I'm looking also for teeth wear. But just as it's getting interesting, the conversation is brought to a stop. The Marineland representative wants to know exactly what Ingrid's filming and why she's here. Well, have a good day. Thank you very much. You Thank too. you. Take care. Bye. And in light of the questioning, Ingrid wants to get her research underway as quickly as possible. But before she starts, I'm interested in finding out how she deals with resistance to what she believes in. Because there's always that thin line as well, isn't there? Between you, you sounding like you're excuse the term, but a crazy activist. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, to the general public and also being someone that's actually really informing them about something real and realistic and that yep. they can relate to and, and, and believe, you know? Yeah. So how do you fight that battle? Well, you know, what I always do is I present the facts. Yeah. And then the facts speak for themselves. So as a scientist, if you can present the facts, mm. then it's logical to then take the next step and go, OK, well, that's not really what we should be doing. Look, this ball playing behaviour, it looks cute, but that's not natural. How many dolphins have you ever seen out in the wild in any documentary playing with a ball? And have a look on the end of the rostrum, on the end of the tip. See, look at the wounds. Yeah, you see that right on, on the, the tip, top. Yeah. On the top and the bottom. And what's that? Is that where he's been? That's self-mutilation, and it's actually bleeding. You can see it. Are these natural though? Would, would these dolphins have injuries like this in the wild? Sure they do get injuries in the wild and sure they get rake marks in the wild too, but the fact of the matter is that this is not natural in here. So anything that happens because they're in here is not natural. You know what? If you look at these concrete walls, there is nothing for these animals to look at. There is Which nothing... is interesting because the sea lions do seem to have, and the seals seem to have more enrichment. No, the, on the surface they do. That's, for yeah. you, yeah. that's for you to look at. Right, that's not okay. for the animals. So why don't they put things like rocks under here? Hello, because they can't keep it clean easily. Oh. This is a dolphin, a different dolphin again, and more injuries on it. And this one, you have a look when it lifts its head out, you'll see a dark line on the side of its like almost where its cheeks would be. Can yeah. you see that dark line there? You'll watch when it lifts its head out now. See that dark line? Yeah. That is because it's unnaturally bending its head like this so all the time. So that's almost like a stretch mark, is it? Yeah, well, kind of, it's a crease from look at, lifting its head above the surface all the time. The observations that Ingrid is making are so easy to miss for an untrained eye. But judging by what she's saying, they're also strong indications of distress within captivity. And it seems that in Ingrid's eyes, things are just as distressing for the orca. What does it do to you when you see them in a place like this? This makes me feel ill. It makes me feel disgusted that humanity can do this to these amazing, intelligent animals and think it's OK to sit there and clap and laugh. And, and it's very demeaning for the animals. They have no choice. Uh, but I, I mean, arguably, the audience clapping and stuff, that's not them. You know, it's not because of them that these orcas are here, that's because of the park, but it's, I suppose... No, they're they're, they're, the orca are here because of the people. From a tourist point of view, if they were to come here, yeah. they would see this tank and they would think, oh, you know, it's, it's a decent size. Not taking into consideration that, oh, it's a decent size, it's nothing compared to the ocean. Yeah. But they'd look and they'd say it's a decent size. Right, and this is what I mean about the education. They're not educating them that these animals would normally travel 200 kilometres a day right a day and not just for one day not just for one week but all the time that's what these animals do and what do you think they're getting here roughly well i've watched between the shows and mostly the animals are stationary they're not moving at all 
And, you know, unfortunately, the aquarium gives information to the public and says, well, you know, we provide them with food so they don't need to swim. Well, that's a load of rot because these animals have spent millions of years evolving. They have a need, a biological need to swim. That's what they evolved for, for swimming. So if you keep them penned up, then you're going to have a problem with that. To me, seeing this, there appears to be a real connection between the trainer and the orca. Is that just to an untrained eye? Yeah. I mean, the only connection that the orca have to the trainer is that they give them the food. If you went in there and, and fed them for a week, they'd have that connection with you too. It's not a bond. There's a bond certainly on the human part. You can't deny the fact that oh, these guys... Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, you can't tell me that these guys don't care about them. You see them interacting with the orca and, and they spend a lot of time with them. That, that's not the point. The point is that the orca have got no choice. It's a prison. It's, that's exactly what it is. But it's even worse than a prison because the prisoners have done something wrong. These guys did nothing wrong except for look beautiful. I can tell Ingrid's passionate, but I'd like to see some more evidence of what she's witnessed, so I've agreed to meet with her later in the day. But first, before I leave tomorrow, I want to try one last time to give Marineland a chance to have their say. But it seems they're making this as difficult as possible. And after waiting, waiting, and waiting some more, the lady I've been trying to contact for months has come to chat and somewhat surprisingly has agreed to an interview in the park tomorrow before we leave. So that went weirdly well. We've been told, yes, we can have an interview. It's just whether it now they deliver on their promise. I've got another number to call, which I don't know why I didn't get given it beforehand, um, but we're going to call them. And hopefully tomorrow we'll have that interview sorted. Brilliant. But after ringing the press office as suggested, that phone number doesn't exist. Convenient. Thankfully, after a very long drawn out process and a bit more digging around, I've managed to speak to their press officer. They told me that they'll call in the morning to confirm, but I have to say, I'm not convinced. All right, so one of the first things that I wanted to do was just show you some of the teeth. You can see, especially on these, how the tops are just worn off. So they would normally be pointed like this. Yeah. Right. And so here, the wear has got to the extreme where they've actually had to drill in to take out the pulp. And so if she goes and smacks that on the concrete, it's likely to just fracture. But the interesting thing is if you see the, these teeth like this, mm -hmm. that's relatively normal. Uh, but I'm going to show you another orca where you don't see any teeth at all. Wow, and yeah, if there's you have a look, literally nothing. Yeah, there's literally no teeth. So no teeth in the back row and no teeth in the front row here. So the big push in captivity now is that they're trying to challenge people like myself making statements about the orca's teeth being worn in captivity and they're saying things like, in the wild some orca have got worn teeth. And they are correct. But again, they're distorting the message mm. because in the wild that happens through prey handling. Well, there's none of that going on, right? right it's straight yeah. down the throat through the type of food feeding that they do, so we believe it's possibly suction feeding, sucking okay. things in. Well, again, hello, that's not happening. The, the truth of the matter is that these animals in captivity, their teeth wouldn't be like this in the wild. This is the calf. So if you look at this, okay, they look mm -hmm. like a series of Vs. Mm -hmm. Those are from where the rake, the teeth went in and then the, the orca moved away. So they've left this V mark. I mean, look, Rake marks happen in the wild, but you don't see calves generally mm. bitten like this. And what's interesting is, even while we were there, this was happening. So this was yesterday. Today I've got another photograph. So you want to see these V marks. Yep. So here we go. Here's the V. I can see straight and away. And here's the, ray, uh, the little round one, mm. and here's new bite marks. Yeah. Look at that, and you can see right there the fresh flesh. So this is what your ticket buys you. I mean, you were asking me before, what, what are the solutions out there? So yeah. let's have a look at something. One thing that I've been involved in is the concept of a cetacean sanctuary or right. a sea pen. And this is a very real island. Okay. Whereabouts? And, well, if I told you, I'd have to kill you. Uh, okay. All right. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't matter where the island is. All right, so, what I'd say to you then instead is, could this be Europe? 
This island could yeah. be anywhere. So the idea here is that you can have multiple C pens, so they're, they're separated. Mm -hmm. But if you wanted to, you can open up a gate in between, or you can remove this net here, and the animals have got a bigger area. And then also, this is a corridor that we can move animals from one pen to the next. Oh, nice. And the idea as well is that let's say that we've got an animal that's now transitioning into a rehabilitation process mm -hmm. because it's got good potential for being released out into the wild. So we want to distance it more and more away from the people. Perhaps it comes back at the end of a week and we reassess things, or it might just be bye-bye dolphin. So do you think that these sea pens and sea sanctuaries could end up being led or driven by the current aquariums. It'd be fantastic if they did that. I mean, these are the guys who have the current knowledge on the medications for the animals, on the food for the animals, and sure, we want to help them improve, but they know those animals best. Yeah. Right? So we would like to see a full-on cooperation with them. It's promising to hear that people like Ingrid are keen on cooperating with the likes of Marineland. But the next day... Hi, yeah, how are you? Any news? Things aren't looking quite as cooperative for me. The press officer called asking me to email more people at the park. And only after doing everything they'd asked, they've agreed to the interview on the condition that I show them our footage so far first. And after doing so, a very familiar face has appeared for our interview. This is John Kershaw, the zoological director of Marineland. He knows everything there is to know about the animals in this park and why, for one, Marineland have them in the first place. For one thing, for shareholders, they make money. Let's not make any bones about that. They're, they're, we're a business. We, we're, we are not financed by anybody from outside. Yeah. So the care we give to our animals comes through the money that our visitors give us, so we have to make money. As far as public perception is concerned, yes, it's changing. The public are, are asking for more. They're asking, they don't want to come in and see dolphins dancing like we did back in the 70s mm -hmm. with a rose in their mouth and a hula hoop. Right. Nobody wants to see that anymore. We used to put a hat on their head and a pipe. I was also intrigued as to why Marineland put a ban on their trainers being in the water with the orcas. There were two deaths in three months. There was one in the States and one in the Canaries. Right. In three months. So if something would have happened here straight away afterwards, I don't know how I'd really explain that to a judge. I was with Ingrid Visser yesterday here in Marineland and one of her qualms was that, one of them, was that this sort of tank would never be sufficient for animals such as whales and dolphins as it's not big enough and it's a concrete tank, okay. uh, which results in things such as self-mutilation and things like stereotypies where they're you know, just pacing or they're just not doing anything. How would you respond to that? I would, I would say she's right. Right, okay. So she's totally right. In, in, in the presence of totally incompetent training staff and bad care for the animals. But that's the case of every animal in captivity, as far as I'm concerned. Various other people have said to me that sea sanctuaries, sea pens, they're the way forward. Yeah. What would your response be to that? They're still in captivity in a sea pen. It's exactly the same thing. It's exactly what we do here. You'd still need to feed these guys, because there's not enough fish going to come into, come into their, their pen for them to be able to support themselves. Right. The other problem with the sea pen is you're talking now about animals that were born in this environment that have been in contact with probably with a lot of germs that the animals at the sea have not been in contact with. They've had antibiotics when they were sick. Is it a good idea just for the sake of four animals? They should be here. We need to know all this stuff about these guys. What about these lesions here? Yeah, those are, when, well, this is an old animal for a start. Right, okay. They're, they're, those, are, those are scuff marks, those are, those are grazed knees, those are mucking about. Don't forget, these guys have got no hands up. Yep. If they want to find what's going on, they're going to do this with it, they're going to push it around, they're going to, they're going to muck about with the bottom of the pool, they're going, to, they're going to take algae, they're going to pick up fish from the bottom if there's any there. Yeah. They're going to get their toys from the bottom. So obviously that's the first thing that's going to come into contact with anything. So when they're kind of, what well, looks like they're chewing on the concrete, for example, mm -hmm. what's their reasoning behind that? It's just investigation. It's just messing about. It's just something else to do. But it's another reason. It shows that these animals are permanently inquisitive and permanently wanting to learn. There was also, um, on Ingrid's research that she did, there was a crease on their neck. It's because it? they spend their lives vertically. Right. Probably, yeah. So yeah, that wouldn't be, that. you'd agree with that? Yeah, it's I think, yeah, I'd out. never thought of that, to be honest. Yeah. But yeah, why not? Upright is not a natural position. Okay. Because what happens down there... Yeah. In the wild is very important to them. Because something could come in. I don't them. think you'd ever see a wild dolphin vertical. Yeah. Looking around like this. Yeah. Or if you did, there's something wrong with it. So no no, upright is not is not the way they would be in, in but don't forget their their world is outside the pool. Well that's the final thing I want to ask you. 
is everything is outside the pool. I'm guessing for the purpose of the audience, how comes there aren't rocks and things for them to interact with under the pool where they spend most of their time? Because they do that more often. <laughs> so it's what they do in the wild as right. well. So it's not a case of, of uh, it's harder to clean, it's more money, it's a no. case of no, for the no, safety no. of the animals. No, if we could leave, if we could leave the environment full of algae with a load of rocks and sand at the bottom. Can you imagine how easy that would be? We wouldn't be paying divers for a start. See those guys over there? They'd be yeah. out of work. I'm surprised at how seemingly open John is being, and more to the point, that he's not altogether dismissing, and in some cases, agreeing with certain things Ingrid has said. I want to address some of the issues surrounding the orca, though, and John has agreed to give us a closer look behind the scenes. And one of the first things I want to address is the fact that the sea is surely a better environment for these animals. It's a better environment for an animal that's used to being in the sea, yes. But this is a better environment for animals that were born in this environment. And you're never going to convince them to the contrary. So they would never, in your eyes, be able to adapt out there? No. Why would they bother? They're, they're, they're constantly, well, you'd have to brainwash them. You'd have to take away everything they know at the moment. It just wouldn't be fair. Huh? It wouldn't be releasing it, it would be kicking them out. Some people say to, have said to me, including Ingrid, that it's all motivated by food. Yeah, that's what I used to think. Maybe she should come and work with us for a day and see how it works now. When she was here last, it probably was still in that era, you know, in, in the 80s. But don't forget, if your motivation is appetite-based, as the appetite goes down, so does the motivation. If it's no challenge, they're going to go, well, yeah, they are, and that's not interesting. The orcas seem reluctant to come to the back pool where we're filming, and I can't help but wonder if it's due to the difference in pool size. These pools are much smaller, but it's not because they're smaller that they're not as good. The main thing is that you have to have equal interaction in every single pool. You can't have one pool that you use just for parking the animals. They just get out of the way, you go out the back. There's no out the back. There's no, let's go and do this in another pool. But don't forget, there are social ties that you have to respect as well. If you say to a mother, you go there, we're gonna work with the baby, and she goes, no, 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 which she will, she's a mother. Then you can't, there's nothing you can do about that. Natural bonding is not something that you can pull apart, which is why they say if we, we separate mums and babies, you try. And as mother and baby arrive, it's Marineland's male calf that I want to find out more about. In your eyes then, is he a potential breeding male? He future? is in, in the world community, yes he is, but not here, not, right. with, not with his mum. He is a potential giver of sperm, yes. And you do hear stories of inbreeding oh, within captivity? Oh, it happens in the wild. Right. At least one generation must do. Does inbreeding happen, has it happened here? I'm sure it has done, yeah. So looking here, this baby's got a rake mark. When you get fighting animals, the rake marks are all situated around the head area because they go head on. That's underneath. That's, that's playing puppy dogs. Whilst this may be the case, I can't help but feel that if this orca was being attacked, surely it would try and move its head out of the way first. And as a result, the other orca's teeth would catch its body. But it's the comments that Ingrid made about the adult male orca's teeth that I'd like to address with John next. We noticed in the pictures that his, his teeth are, are quite gnawed down. They're, they're worn down, yeah. They're worn down. Yeah. What's that a result of? Investigating things with his teeth. Right, so that's not, again, you know, where he's been gnawing and self-mutilating. No, it's not mutilation, no. It, it, it could be, if you want to consider it negative, you could consider it a sign of boredom, if you wanted right. to. But it's a, if you want killer whales die in the wild of teeth problems. Uh -huh. They have big teeth problems because don't forget these guys are crushing bone all day and they break teeth very often and they die of, of, of tooth abscesses. Incredibly, John has more or less just repeated word for word what Ingrid had earlier predicted he would say about the topic. But I'm intrigued to see what he also has to say about another issue to do with their teeth. There seems like there's drill marks yes, in them. We drill them, out. we drill them and instead of filling them, we choose just to keep them flushed. Because if we fill a tooth like that, we're not going to be doing it in the conditions, the antiseptic conditions that would be, that would be feasible in, with man. We can't do this sort of thing with a killer whale tooth. So a killer whale tooth that is open once, stays open, and is flushed daily. Taking into account SeaWorld's decision to ban the breeding of orca in 2016, I thought the likes of Marineland would be pressured into following suit. But judging by something I saw whilst at the park, it seems that it may not be the case. We saw, uh, last time we were here, again, there was a, there was a tube kind of being lined up uh, and the orca was on its back. Yep. Um, 
What's this preparation for? Is it artificial insemination? No, that one wasn't. That's a fecal sample. For the training for the, for the artificial insemination, we don't actually put things in. Right. Because you have to go a long way in. But you do do be... that regularly? Or... Oh, it can be done, yeah. Right. Yeah, she's, she's trained for it. She's trained for artificial insemination. So are there any plans in the near future or plans at all to breed from her? No, none at all. We have nothing planned, no. So you don't intend for this population of orca that you've got here to grow in any I'd like it to, but, but there's, a, there's a definite trend to slow down on this sort of thing, and, and, and our sperm comes from SeaWorld. <laughs> right, so that's what SeaWorld donates the sperm sample. Yeah, we're still, we're still talking, the, we're still, we're talking with them about why, for a start, they would do this. Have they shot you in the back, stabbed you in the back by doing this? No, they haven't stabbed us in the back. They're, I mean, SeaWorld, SeaWorld, they live as they want to, and they believe in what they believe in, but I'd really like to see the reasoning behind all of this to find out why it actually happened. I know they got 20-something whales, so it's going to take years before their whale population disappears. We've got four. We're in a little bit of a different, a different situation to what they are. Do you think there's ever a future here where you may move away from the kind of the theatrics and the, and the music and have it more of kind of an, what you're doing to me basically, explaining the, yeah. the methods behind that. Do you think there's ever a chance that that may be a direction that you guys would go? I think we, the, the actual facility itself would have to be so spectacular so that there, there, there is a reason for coming and seeing because there still has to be some sort of, to attract visitors, and let's, let's be very honest, that's what we're here for, attracting visitors. To attract visitors, there would have to be a, a, a fantastic facility that would attract if there's not the, the, the show of the animals themselves to attract. But I'm sure we're going to go towards a situation where all pools will have tunnels, there'll be different areas you can visit, there'll be small coves, there'll be water currents, there'll be... I'm sure we're going towards modern facilities being more and more natural. I'm sure we're going to go that way. And I'm sure we're going to naturally move away from everything we're doing now simply because everybody's seen it. And it will be, and it will be crippling financially to continue doing the same thing when the public is asking for new things all the time, permanently. After four days at Marineland, I'm leaving with real mixed emotions. I have no doubt that the staff who work with these incredible animals love them dearly, but I also can't help but feel the people behind the scenes see these animals as nothing more than a way to fill their pockets and are too far removed to see that these animals, regardless of whether it's self-inflicted or not, are silently suffering in what can only be described as a modern-day marine circus. But the reassuring thing for me is I've realised that the prospect of organisations, marine biologists, and hopefully marine parks working together to create the best future for these animals isn't a million miles away. And one day, I'm sure you'll only be able to see these animals where they truly belong.